Good afternoon, everyone. If we could all settle down and so we can get started, please. I want to take this time to welcome you to our fifth annual celebration of Black History Month presented by Long Beach Unified School District. Yes, yes, this is our fifth one and we hope and we know that you will enjoy it. Now, I, at this particular time, I am going to do acknowledgments. If I forget anyone, or if I see someone that I know is a power that be, but I don't know your exact title, I will ask you to stand and you may uh, say it yourself, okay? Charge it to my head and not my heart. Uh, I don't see our superintendent here, so um, Chris Steinhauser, we all know he is our superintendent. Um, I see Megan Kerr, who is our board, one of our board members for District 1. I saw her. Welcome, welcome. Um, of course, Dr. Felton Williams, who is our board member, member for District 2. Welcome. He's in the back getting something to eat. Uh, Diane Craighead, I believe I saw her. Thank you so much for joining us again. She's from District 5. Jay Camarie, I see, but I don't know your title, but I know you're up there with the people. <laughs> and um, I want to acknowledge Ruth Ashley, who is the Deputy Superintendent of HRS and the boss of me as well, and it's a pleasure working with her. And also, um, Brian, Brian, please don't be upset. Can you say your last name for me, please? Brian Mos Moscovich, and he is our Assistant Superintendent in, uh, for the elementary department. Thank you and welcome for, and thank you for joining us. And Jill Baker, who is our deputy superintendent in the middle school office of schools. She's the deputy of schools. And I don't see Mr. Pete Davis. Okay, Mr. Pete Davis, who is the assistant superintendent of high schools. Thank you for joining us. Um, if there's anyone else, Oh, okay, Mr. Steinhauser, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. I believe that's it for now, so let's go ahead and get this party started and just kick back and enjoy the experience and learn with us and just enjoy. So at this particular moment, we will have an invocation by Ola Simpson. Hello, everyone. If we could just bow our heads in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today humbly to thank you. We thank you for the blessings and for keeping out your promises. We thank you not only for your wonderful times, but we also thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for helping us through the hard times. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your undesired favor that you have shown upon us throughout the years. Lord, we pray that your continued blessings in the years to come. We pray for your healing where the healing is needed, your comfort where the comfort is needed, and your provision where the provision is needed. We ask for your blessing upon this celebration because we know that no accomplishments are possible without your blessings. Lord, keep your love at the forefront of our minds today as we are God in light for all we set forth out to accomplish with this celebration. And that's Son Jesus' name. We all say amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we will be getting a special tribute from the Color Guard led by NJROTC Navy from Cabrillo High School. Let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Present. 
time for the Pledge of Allegiance, and we'd all join. And one, two, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to its republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> okay, so now we will have the national anthem by our own Paula Smith. Let's give her a warm, warm welcome. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so bright? At the twilight's last gleaming, whose bright stripes and bright stars through the perilous flight o'er oh, the ramparts we watched were so gay. And the rocket red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our snap flag was still there. Oh, say. That star spangled banner yet wave o'er oh, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Everyone can be seated. You may be seated. Harry. That was awesome. Don't pay attention. We're just going to rearrange some more furniture to make it a little bit more roomy in here. We're going to go ahead and continue with the program. So next, we have a young lady from Bernie Elementary, and she'll be doing a presentation and uh, serving our country with respect to Catherine Johnson. Let's give Zion Trailer a very warm welcome. My name is Captain Jean Johnson, and I will start with my speech. 
There is no bathroom. There are no colored bathrooms in this building or any outside the West Campus, which is half a mile away. Did you know that? I have to walk to 10 book two just to relieve myself, and I can't use one of the handy bikes. Picture that, Mr. Harrison, my uniform, skirt below my knees, my heels, and a simple string of pearls. Well, I don't own pearls. Lord knows you don't pay colors enough to afford pearls. And I work like a dog, day and night, living off a of coffee from a pot none of you want to touch. So, excuse me if I have to go to the restroom a few times a day. That's the thing I said to my boss when he asked me why it takes so long to go to the bathroom. My name is Katherine G. Johnson, a mathematician who helped NASA for John Glenn to orbit to space and help John Glenn come back to Earth. More importantly, I helped three men get on the moon. Um, I was born on August 26, 1918 at West Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. My name is Catherine Coleman. My mom is Juliet Coleman. My dad is Joshua Coleman. And I had three siblings. I was married to James Francis Goebel, and he was born in 19... I mean, I married him in 1939 to 1956. I have three daughters named Kansas, Juliet, and Catherine. I married James Francis Goldman. I um, Chance James Francis Goldman died of brain tumor in 1956. I married Jim Johnson in 1959. It has to be hard for a young lady from an elementary school, so let's give her some warm love. Thank you so much, sweetie. And thank you to her parents. Great job, sweetie, great job. And now we are going to have another selection from our songbird, Miss Paula Smith, a change is gonna come. I love that song. It puts you in the, you know, in the February month mood. <laughs> Miss Paula, where'd you go so far? <laughs> I was born by the river in a little tent. And oh, just like the river I've been running ever since it's been a long a long time coming but i know a change gonna come oh yes it will it's been too hard living but i'm afraid to die Cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Oh, I go to the movies. And I go downtown and somebody keeps on telling me, oh, stop hanging, hanging around. And then I go to my brother and I say, brother, help me, please. But he winds up on knocking me down on my knees. It's been a long, a long time coming. But I know a change going to come. Oh, yes, it will. Come on, let's give her some love, because it has to be hard singing with no music and try to stay in some, and sing, sing in front of your peers. 
You did a great job, Paula, great job, great job. And one more acknowledgement that I did not do earlier, and I wanted to acknowledge Principal Sparkle Peterson. I know I saw her a moment ago. Sparkle, will you please stand? <laughs> Sparkle has been with the district for 33 years and 18 years as a principal, but you can't tell because she looks like she's 25. <laughs> Sparkle will be retiring this year. And so we wanted to acknowledge Sparkle. She has, I mean, that name suits her. She's sparkling. She's always the same. Anytime I've seen her places other than, and if she sees me, she speaks. She doesn't act like, you know, she acts like a regular person, even though she's, you know, she got that position. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and I wish you well on your retirement, Sparkle. And thank you so much for being who you are. And I wish you all the best. Okay, so this is the part where our main guest speaker, I've been waiting for this particular opportunity. Give me a second. So our main speaker is going to be Mr. J. M. Rice, who I am honored and proud to call my dad. So he is going to speak, this is him, when he was 19 years old and he was in the Air Force. And so he will be coming in his own way. He's our main speaker, so let's give him our undivided attention and uh, let him share his experience. He's very passionate about it. He always tells us stories, my brother and my siblings and I, of things that happened when he was in the military and how he enjoyed being, and he is very, he, he enjoyed his experience. And so it gives me great honor, and I'm very, very proud. He has been with us for every single Black History Month celebration. This is our fifth one, and he has attended all of them. So let's give him our undivided attention. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I think that protocol has been established to all to the powers be, there be. Uh, I'm grateful to be here in this spot today and to see your faces. I feel that my assignment was given to me to talk about me. Although I feel that I could have spoken on a subject that has a, a legacy behind it. I'm not a, a legacy person, but I could have talked, spoke about uh, Plessy versus Ferguson in Louisiana, or Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. Nevertheless, I want to be obedient. <laughs> My name is J. McClure Rice. Thank you, Joy. My daughter, there's my son, Broderick, and there's another daughter of mine at the table. We call her boss lady. <laughs> And we have another daughter who's um, working today in this school district at Jordan High, Patrice. I will begin stating some of the activities and experience that I was involved in in the United States Air Force. Um, as I stated before, there are many other activities and legendary things that we could have spoken on today.
but as I stated, I will be obedient. I was raised as a country boy in the country where you plant corn and cotton and peas and beans. And uh, I worked in the fields. But when I finished high school, my teachers in those days, I want you to remember that I came up through the segregated area where uh, the law did not work for me to be integrated. I came up in a situation where it, it said, it stated, separate but equal, pseudo said, but it was not. I grew up where uh, I passed a school building, high school building, seven miles, miles from my home. Yet I traveled 21 miles picking up kids to go to an you know, all uh, colored school. And so when school was out, I joined the Air Force. A year before school was out, I took an exam and the recruiter told me when school, um, when he get in his next, for his next quarter, uh, he would call me and then I would be inducted into the Air Force. But school had started and I drove a school bus. I didn't want to spread my business throughout the community. So I picked up the school bus and I said, when the recruiter calls, I'm just going to leave the bus and go on in the Air Force. <laughs> but <clears throat> I picked the bus, I uh, checked out my bus and started the school. And about uh, two weeks, he called me and he said, are you ready? And I had a talk with him. And he said, well, you can finish your high school in, in the um, Air Force, but you might would just want to finish and then go. I'll hold a spot for you at the end of the school year. And it may not look like it now, but I got to drive in the school bus where I was from. You had some prestige driving a school, uh, bus driver and then playing on the sports team. And I just enjoyed those pretty girls saying, come on, Joseph, come on, Joseph. With that introduction now, I was inducted into the Air Force from Charlotte, North Carolina. And they put us on a plane one night. I'd been gone from home two days. I was at the induction center being examined and everything. And we got on a, a, a we called it a Goonie Bird. It's an airplane with two front wheels and one in the back, you know. And we went from Charlotte to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's only about 100 miles, but it felt like I had gone <clears throat> 2,000 miles riding an airplane and, and going into Atlanta, Georgia at night, all those beautiful lights, it looked so pretty. I said, if heaven looks any better than this, just give me Georgia. <laughs> so, and we, from there, we went to Lackland Air Force Base. We caught a plane, they put us on a plane and went to Lackland Air Force Base. And there, uh, Early in the morning, we see groups of guys here, groups of guys here, groups over here. They was marching and cussing and up, 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 up. Get up there, get up there. What are you doing? <laughs> Not striking them, but just, uh, you know, almost. <laughs> and uh, I said, what did I get myself into? <laughs> and from that time, in a few minutes, we were ready to go eat. And I want you to remember my introduction. I'm a country boy, and I've never been integrated. I had some uh, white boys who were my friends, but uh, I never sat and ate 
with other races. But we walked into what we call a chow hall. You would call it a cafeteria. Big, broad place. And I see milk, you know these milk places where you just go up and pump your milk out. They have big five gallon cans. And I didn't know how to <laughs> pick my food. So I get behind this one dude here and I said, dude, can I get the milk out of there? He said, yeah, yeah, you yeah. I said, all I, he said, oh, you can eat. Make sure you just get what you can eat. And we were going down the line like this. And uh, there were um, eggs, bacon, corn flakes, bananas, bread, toast, and other stuff. I said, you mean I can get a taste of all of this? <laughs> he said, all you can eat. And the fellas behind the grill cooking, and they said, what do you want? How you want your eggs? How, how, you, how you want your eggs? And, and I didn't know how to tell him how I wanted. The guy in front of me, he said, scramble. I said, I'm going to scramble. <laughs> so, and we went from there, and uh, they were changing us around, giving us, issuing clothing. And they issued clothing, and I'm giving you my experience now. Gave me five sets of underwear, white, I mean lily white. <laughs> I said, oh, wow. And it may seem a little uh, comical to you, but every time I went to the bathroom, I just had to look. <laughs> and I had three sets of shoes, shirts, and clothing, and I bathed, I showered every day. Every day I showered, and it was just so good. I said, man, I should have been in here a long time ago. <laughs> and they would take us out in the morning and march us, and then we'd go eat, and then march a little uh, later, and it seemed as though it was only about an hour. All right, we'll fall out for chow. We would march to the chow hall again, eat. And we would eat, and then we would go and march, and have classes and seminars, and then it'd be time to go eat again. I said, man, every time I turn it, three meals a day. <laughs> wow. And there's one thing about those three meals. Every meal had potatoes. You know the Irish potatoes? In the morning, uh, you would have um, this... Uh, they, well, you cut them up and eat them with eggs. You slice them, hash brown, yes, yeah, thank you. And then at lunch, you would either have soup or mashed potatoes, vice versa, for the afternoon. So that was good. And one of the outstanding things that uh, come to my mind, uh, I know I'm on time restraint, and I'm trying to restrain because I could tell this story all day long. <laughs> But after we were there for a while, they gave us a test. It was an examination. And all day long, and I assume it was probably something like a SAT test, uh, it's called an aptitude test. I didn't know what the word meant. But the guy that was in charge of us, he says, do the best you can, because this will determine uh, your career in the Air Force. That still never registered to me. I went in the Air Force. I had three brothers who were in the Army. All I knew was guns. I just thought I would be carrying you know, a gun and shooting and learning how to kill people. But we had that test. It was all day long. You, you're familiar, it's kind of like your test that's given to us now. 
and they had the papers there, and they had, they called them then proctors, people walking around making sure that you had the right test and that you were doing the right thing and that you weren't cheating and peeping. And we took that test, they said, that's where I learned, they said that you um, answer the questions and mark the ones that you know you know. Then you come back and mark the ones you think you know. And then you can come back and just hit or miss for the ones that you don't know anything about. <laughs> and and that's, uh, that's a little comical, but it worked for me. It worked for me even when I had exams working for the city of Los Angeles. You know, you get promotions, you take exams. I would do all that I knew and all that I thought I knew and the ones that I didn't know, <clears throat> I would say, here the mid and mighty more. Here we go. <laughs> and it seemed to help me. But that test, they would make you drop your pencils at a certain time when that portion was up. They would drop, drop. You had to stop. And you'd be wanting to, oh, I could like it. Mm, you couldn't do that. You had to drop it. But about a week later, the results came back. Mind me, I'm not knowing what's going on, really. And uh, they came back, and they would talk to different, called out different names. Rice, Jones, Ellenberg. And said, you will be going to Biloxi, Mississippi to radio contact school. And John, you will be going to uh, this school somewhere where the people learn to be a tower operator. And they were calling out with me. They said, Rice, you will be headed to Denver, Colorado, to Colorado, to Lori Air Force Base, Denver, Colorado. Oh, okay. I said, uh, Sir, what, what kind of work would I be doing? He said, you're going to school for six months? I said, oh, Lord, <laughs> the, the school, I, I came in the Air Force to get away from school. <laughs> and uh, I asked him, I said, what kind of job, what kind of work would I be doing? You'll be going for weapons and armament training. You'll be schooling. And uh, I said, uh, what, what would I be doing? And uh, he used the curse word, said, you got a D, good job. You, oh, so he said, you'll be working on aircraft, on jet fighters, and on them big old bombers. You, you, your schooling will fit you to work on that, not to fly, but in certain areas that we would work. It had maybe 12 different fields, uh, qualifications to do. You take the cameraman, they would come, they would just work on the camera. They didn't bother about bombs or tires or anything. And so I was in that field <clears throat> and uh, went to school for six months. I don't know how I made that. I, I, that's where I learned to understand what, like electricity, uh, AC, and DC. I, they taught me what AC current meant, alternating current. They would show it in a screen at that time. They show alternating current, it'd be waving and going. DC is direct current, it didn't wave. I said, man. Boy, how did I get this? <laughs> Remind me, it was not easy. If you uh, say in a class of uh, 40 guys, uh, if you would give us a test every week, and if we failed the test more than one time, they would call washout or phase out. That means that you couldn't make it. They would send you back to a place. Of course, we had to have garage attendants and those type people. They would send you back to a place 
where it was just OJT, on-the-job training. And I did not want that. I had gotten a taste of my status at that time, but it was, <clears throat> I was blessed to have a guy who was good with the books. But he, this guy, it was hard for him to tie his shoes. He, it just worked that way. I could tie the shoe. But I was a little slow in the books, and we would go down in Colorado, you know, in July there's snow on the mountains, and uh, real snow. And <laughs> they would uh, had uh, furnaces in the bottom underneath. We would go down at night. I would share with him, how many of you know what a, a Phillips screwdriver looks like? You know what a flat screwdriver looks like. This this young man, he did not know the difference between a Phillips screwdriver and a flat screwdriver. And at that time, uh, we did call it for a while a cross point screwdriver. And that was a Phillips screwdriver. So I told him uh, the mechanical nature of things and he helped me with the book training and what we needed to do. We went to basic, finished my basic training in the morning and went to school class in the afternoon every day for six months and we made that. And I was assigned uh, to uh, Cannon Air Force Base, Clovis Air Force Base at that time. And I went home, stayed a few days and went to my new uh, location and uh, I had a chance as an airman down on the flight line, first of all, is to come as close. Many of you probably don't know it. Excuse me, young lady. I was this close to the then late President Eisenhower. And because we were on the line, and he was driving in a big car to wave at people going down. that I was uh, sarcastic, but you know, what a, why are you so excited? I didn't see anything to, to be excited for. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we had uh, a good time uh, doing that st uh, stint, uh, doing, I was in Colorado. I went to work on, uh, I'm moving over I, I, I'm moving uh, on forward. Huh? All right, I'm moving. Uh, I'm moving, moving forward. Uh, I worked on the flight line uh, as a weapons mechanic, and uh, I want you to know that uh, I have handled. You, you've heard of the atom bomb, but you remember that that change in a nuclear bomb. I have had that nuclear bomb in my hand, in my hands. And let me tell you about that. If you, I'm trying, I'm shorting this thing up. You think I'm long, I'm shorting this thing up. <laughs> we had special teams, five guys that would load this nuclear bomb on, on this airplane. But we had to get it ready, it was preparation. And just before that, I'll I come back to this. Just before that, they had asked me, they told me they'd be giving me top secret. I had a secret clearance, but they won't, they're giving me top secret clearance. And they asked some names of some people back in the country where I was from, the farmers. And I gave five or six names. And don't you know the FBI and the Secret Service, they was walking across the fields and talking to people, asking people about, you know, Joe Rice, and, 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 and you know, there were white people and colored, 
Uh, it's not black. I didn't know nothing about black people. I was just colored folks. And uh, they were asking those people, do you know him? What, what did he do? Did he ever get in any trouble? And let me tell you, the community where I was from, they, they uh, loved me and they respected me, but they got highly emotional. And they wanted to know, what well, Joe Rice is in trouble because the FBI <laughs> and the Secret Service and, and those guys, you, you take in the country, uh, in the country, in the country, the fields and the farm, and these guys, white and black, walking across with suits on. And that was, that was a sight. That was a sight. And people got uh, 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 active and, and they, 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 they were emotional. What did Joe get into? But it was only to verify the top secret uh, that they were going to issue me. And that's why I was in the situation where I handled a nuclear weapon. You see the bomb on the airplane, you got, you know, see how it's shaped? You've seen the high, high, let me tell you, that's not the half. It's not even a eighth. It's what's on the inside that made the difference. And they told us, said, if you wear your gloves and you had to decontaminate, even with a in it, it may have some residue on it, and don't get it too close to you because it could sterilize you. And you know, <laughs> I held, I held that thing, and we had team teams from uh, uh, from the White House and from headquarters. They would come, uh, high-ranking officials. They would watch us to see how efficient we were in loading that bomb because at that time, everybody was thinking about Russia and you might have to take off and go and, and drop that bomb and we had to be ready. And another thing about the bomb that I liked when I was in there, you can take an aircraft, a fighter plane. If you wanted to drop a bomb in San Diego, we say about 100 miles from here, that plane would go 75 miles and the aircraft would do this. It would come over backwards. And it would pitch that bomb. He would let it loose, that centrifugal force. When he goes back overhead, he would, you know, he would fire it and he would throw it into San Diego because you wouldn't go into the enemy's territory to drop the bomb, but you sling it there and the bomb was timed to where it would go off in San Diego. And I like that part about it. And now I'm going to take my seat. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take my seat. Just a minute, I'm going to take my seat. And, uh, you know, uh, I found out also, and maybe you know, when you ride an airplane, you say if you're flying to East Coast uh, three or four hours, you ever notice when the regular airlines, when they get up, and they ride for maybe about an hour, and it sounded like they turned the engines off. You know, it looked like it gets quiet. I found out there's a good reason for that. Uh, they would be at cruising speed, but when that sound quiets down, the aircraft has used up a bunch of its fuel and lighten the load, and they're in a different atmosphere. The air is thinner up there, and it's easier for them, 35,000 feet, to just uh, it, throw it in cruise control. And my words are saying into cruise control, and you could get to your destination much easier with less fuel and less problem because you're riding above the storms most of the time. And you know life is like that. If we think about the airplane and how that they work, uh, we can ride above the storms in, in life. And don't you know that sometimes we are all in, uh, hit a storm sometime, but just remember that you dump the baggage and get above the resistance. <laughs> Thank you.
Tin cat. Left feet. Who? Father. Great job, that that's my dad. And I've learned so, so much from him. You know, um, we've heard, my brother and my siblings, that we've heard some of those stories and other stories, but he always has a new story to tell us and he always ends it up with something that will, will you be able to use. And you know, like that last part that he said, that was amazing about the storms and you know, this part and that part. He always had, I mean, sometimes I've called my dad upset and crying about something. And before you know it, I feel like a bumbling fool because I'm laughing and crying at the same time because he always has a encouraging, an encouraging word. And not only are they words, they're words of wisdom. Yeah. Words of wisdom. He's a wise man. He's 84 years old. And he has, he has a lot of experience. And yes, he could go on and on and on. He is respecting our time. Dad, thank you so much. I love you. And I thank you for all that you are to our family. I know it's not about that, so let me just get on back to the, the, the business at hand. Thank you all, guys, for embracing him and listening to his stories. And he'll have more if you want to talk, you know, listen some more. I'm sure he has plenty more. But you will learn something. Like Judge Joe Brown used to say, if you listen, you might learn something. So thank you all so much. And we're, we're to the end, actually. So what I'd like to do is find my reading glasses on here somewhere. And we're going to be singing the Black National Anthem, the first verse only, and it will be led by my brother. And as soon as I find the sheet of paper I'm looking for, I wanted to kind of, you know, sometimes you can enjoy a song more if you know just a little bit about, you know, of what it's about. Yes, the words to the song is on the program. So lift every voice and sing, start it as a poem. It was first recited in the year 1900 by 500 school children at the All Black Stanton School in Jacksonville, Florida, as a tribute to President Abraham Lincoln's birthday. James Weldon Johnson, a civil rights activist, lawyer, and principal, I like that part, he was an educator, of the Stanton School wrote, lift every voice and sing. To introduce famed educator as well, Booker T. Washington, who was visiting the school at the time. Johnson, at the time, Johnson's brother, Roseman Johnson, put the poem into music and it officially became a song. In 1919, the NAACP adopted the song as its official Negro National Anthem and it is enjoyed widespread distribution and celebration. During the civil rights movement, many parents, churches, and predominantly black schools went out of their way to ensure that their children knew the words. Please stand and join us in singing our national anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And I want to make sure I look at the words just to make sure that I do the song justice. I want you to sing with me. You don't have to be a great singer, uh, but you can just sing along. Are you ready? I'll start it off. Hopefully it's in a key that is conducive for all of us. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven, till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty, of liberty. Let our rejoicing, let our rejoicing rise high as 
as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea drop that voice sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us sing a song sing a song full of the hope full of the hope that the presence has brought uh, facing facing the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on let us march on till victory is won come on put your hands together come on you did an awesome job Thank you all so much. That's my brother, my sibling. We have a love and hate relationship, but mostly love, mostly love, mostly love. You know what? I believe this is the conclusion of our awesome celebration. Um, I thank you all so, so very much for joining us, those who came off campus, those who came from their homes when they could have been at home, those who gave up their lunch hour. And, and, and I just thank you all, and I'm glad that we were able to spend this time together. And God willing, we'll do it again next year again.